It's the retirement special, and I hope to follow soon. And joining me to talk about all this and so much more, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the man who never says, I told you so, even when he told us so. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jimmy. Pleasure to be here once again. And I'm not here to say I told you so. I'm here to talk with you about what is easily one of the biggest wrestling stories of all time. You're here to rub our nose in it like a dog's piss puddle in the dining room that you call this all along. And you, and and the thing that I'm upset about is I went with you at first. Uh, you almost talked me into it. And then I said, no, no, Vince, is, he's not going to go down without a fight. And he's going to be there till the bitter end. And the bitter end came about three weeks later. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, for the first time in 40 years, Vince McMahon is not the leader of the biggest wrestling promotion in the world. Vince McMahon is not the man in charge of the most giant corporate conglomerate wrestling promotion, the first ever, only ever billion dollar company in wrestling. He's not, he has announced his retirement and it all stems from this one incident that we've been talking about for the past month or so. It's it, Brian, it's almost like an Edgar Allan Poe novel, the telltale tart. That's what they're going to write when they write the story of Vince McMahon's ultimate demise from atop the mountain. I'm Who would have thunk? I'm not sure if that's the title they'll use for this venture. Well, no, I'm going to copyright it, trademark. Um, <laughs> but I've, <sighs> this seemed, even though people thought it was coming and thought it was coming when they heard the news, then we thought, no, obviously Vince is coming out of here and saying, hey, I'm still right here. What precipitated this event, this announcement? I saw somebody speculate it had been made about a week beforehand, but he's been pretty present right along for the past few weeks. Do you think, is there something else that they've found out that may or may not come out? Was it just... An accumulation of, is I've always said Vince was like Trump, but smarter and more articulate. Was he willing to listen to his inner circle, the ones who knew what they were talking about, instead of bringing in the crackpot Giuliani's of the world who thought he was going to barricade in the in Titan Tower and fight it out? I mean, how did this? Obviously, it came out at four oh five on Eastern on Friday afternoon, so that it wouldn't tank the stock price going into the weekend but and also so the story would be somewhat buried in the news it's very it's a very much old school news mentality just because of the way things work nowadays but burying a story late in the afternoon on a friday is an old school trick well it didn't work because it was a buried alive and the undertaker's hand shot back out because people got it anyway they they reported it on wdrb 41 news at four here in Louisville by five o'clock. So boom, it didn't get buried that good. But what do you think precipitated this? What was the straw that broke the chairman's back? Honestly, in the long run, it was actually going public because if his company was still <laughs> private, it wouldn't be an issue like this. But even though he has 80% of the voting shares, he still has a board of directors and he has a stock. And if the entire board of directors walked out because they couldn't ignore what they were finding out about Vince, it would tank the stock. What would the company be worth? Who'd want to do business with the company? We said before, and we don't know whether or not there was any pressure at all, if any of the network partners, the people paying all this money for this content, if they got wary of this and decided they didn't want to do business with Vince, that was a major problem for WWE. We don't know about any of that, but. When I said that it was Vince's goodbye, and he appeared again on the John Cena episode of Raw, and that was his actual goodbye, the last moment of Vince McMahon on TV is him jumping off the stairs. <laughs> After he got hung up on the rope trying to get out of the ring. That was oh. his actual goodbye, because there was no recovery. That's why I thought this. How is he going to come back if, after the first story, 
which sounded fishy right away. And I thought to myself, man, if any of the other things I have heard throughout the years from any of the people who were in the room, if any of them, and not you, obviously, if any of them were remotely Yeah, I didn't even get to be in the room for any of this shit. If any of them were remotely true, I wonder if any of those stories would come out now. And then other stories came out. So I'm thinking, okay, if those came out. And I have heard rumors about other things. And now HBO Real Sports is looking into Vince again. And boy, there's a comeback. I was about, are they going to bring Bob <laughs> Costas back to 30 years later? He's going to fucking drop the strap. It's Armin not the papers out of my hand, motherfucker. I think it was Armin Katayan, right? Because there were two different incidents. There was one with Bob Costas and there was one on Real Sports. Who well, he slapped Costas's notes? Did he not? Or was that the other guy? That was the other. That was real. Sports. That was the other guy. He just the gave one's working Costas, on a special right now. He gave Costas withering glances and brusque remarks. Um, so I think Vince had to go for a number of reasons, especially if there's more to come out. And we don't know this, but I am going to say this: if there is more to come out, enough that they were able to convince him to walk away like this weirdly and publicly and issue weird statements to talent. If this was going to happen, you have to wonder if his focus may be going from, I mean, I don't know. I would think that you may want to, even if nothing happens, get ready for a criminal defense. What? If there are stories coming out about something with women. Well, it's, it seems like so far all the women made a profit. At least it was it was a business transaction, not any criminal offenses. Sexual misconduct. That's what it was. It was he was paying them off for the infidelity and any potential sexual misconduct. But now, is that illegal? Is sexual misconduct illegal? No. Is what I'm saying to you is if the transaction is already completed. If the person who was misconducted against agrees instead of calling the cops to take a settlement of some cash prize, then does that nullify that person's opportunity to press charges criminally because they've, oh, God, you were okay with it a little while ago. Well, that's a Stephen P. New question, but let me ask you this. We should have thought of that when we had him on, but what we anybody out there in, in podcast land, it seems, it seems, if I went and robbed you, Brian, you, you run a bank. And if I go and rob your bank, but then I come back later on and say, look here, I'm sorry. Here's the money. And plus, here's something for your trouble. Are we even? And you accept that. And then later on, you call the cops. Is I don't, I don't know. There's a gray area there, isn't there? I don't know. That's like Stormy Daniels. I'm not sure. But let me ask you this, looking at it from another perspective. If Vince's goal has been to sell the company. If that's the reason why Nick Khan, all of a sudden their agent is working in the company as the chief executive. If Vince's goal is to sell this company, which he has 80% of the voting shares, him and his family and family trusts and grandchildren's future, it's all tied into this stock. If his goal is to sell it and he knows him having to walk away is the only way he'll be able to get it because he's not giving up his shares. That's still there. They're just saying he's giving up any actual role with the company from creative to executive roles. But he still well, has a stock. And well, and let's talk about this. They're saying that, aren't they? But what would have happened? I can't remember when the last time Triple H was the vice president of talent relations. Was it three or four years ago before they brought Johnny Ace back, whatever the case, five years ago. No, I think it was sooner than that. Wasn't he still to head of talent relations after AEW started? I think, okay, well, let's just say, for the sake of argument, four years ago, if Vince had walked out of Titan Tower or his high-priced Stamford condo and gotten run over by a rainbow bread truck, who would have been running the company at that point? It would have been Stephanie. And Triple H. And when did Nick Khan show up? A little bit after that. A little bit after AEW started. Because remember, it was like, oh my God, they got a Khan too. Well, they, okay, but then three years ago, it would have been Triple H, Stephanie, and Nick Khan. Guess who's running the thing now? So. Isn't that just, amazing? That the childhood friend of The Rock and Stephanie McMahon, the childhood friend of Andre the Giant. 
<laughs> would grow up together and run WWE. Who would have thought? And and then on the other side of the fence, Tony Khan, everybody's childhood friend, is running the other one. But but no, seriously. So Vince McMahon now owns or controls 80% of the stock or the voting stock or whatever the way they've got it set up. Stephanie, his daughter, is the co-CEO, which pretty much everybody over the last number of years expected Stephanie to be to step into Vince's spot. And Triple H is in charge of talent, which everybody expected all along, and he was quite some time ago. And that would have happened if something had happened to Vince, like I said. And Nick Khan is the business guy, could now he can really go full force and sell them to Disney and and then Stephanie and Triple H get a couple billion dollars apiece and Vince gets a couple billion dollars and everybody just goes and buys their own private island. But if anybody thinks that Vince McMahon, because he retired, is going to go to the condo and take up fucking knitting, or well, what do old people do these days? I don't know, because he's the only old person I've ever heard of who has no hobbies whatsoever, other than, you know, paralegals or whatever. He has nothing we've ever heard about that he enjoys or likes. He doesn't say, like, oh, I love going to the movies. No, well, no, he, he does have something he enjoys and likes. Running businesses <laughs> and, 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 you know, fucking with people. Uh, but, so, can he possibly ignore the product, not watch it? not have opinions on it. And it's not like that he's not going to be able to get the CEO, at least one of them, on the phone. And isn't she the charwoman also? Stephanie's the charwoman of the WWE? Yeah, see, that's important also to note. Her and Nick Khan are co-CEO, but she's the chairwoman. There's no co-chairperson. She's the I thought, chairwoman. I thought somebody said she was the charwoman. I'm sorry, she's the chairwoman. Chairwoman, the charwoman. The charwoman. It's an, you've never been to Victorian England, have you? That would have been a great... Maybe that's something for Travis on, on one of these also. Vince is a charwoman, or Stephanie. But anyway... Not this one, though, Travis. No. Not this one. You can do something else. I got some ideas. But nevertheless, the point is, if Vince is going to be talking to Stephanie regularly because she's his daughter, and Triple H is his son-in-law, and he's going to be hanging around Stephanie whenever she's talking to Vince. We, we're we all thinking, oh my God, what changes are going to occur? There's going to be some, obviously. But how drastic is it going to be with the president? Another way that Vince is like Trump. Even when out of office, his presence looms large and the menace is still there. Well, we've heard that John Laurinaitis is out. Well, yeah. So that's and, one of Vince's that's, guys. That's a plus. That's and that's a Vince plus. guy, though, more than anything. I mean, if you're looking at it in terms yeah. of the dynamics, the other big Vince guys are clearly Kevin Dunn and Bruce Pritchard, and everyone's right now looking at Kevin Dunn. Yes, and a lot of people have tweeted me about this. And, I, I again, nobody, I don't care how good you are or whether you're a great, wonderful person or a miserable human being like old Bucky Beaver. Nobody in the history of, can you think television has been the executive producer of any one show, genre, continuation of series, whatever, for 40 fucking years? And so Dick Clark. it's. That's it. That's because he owned the production company. That's right. It was his. So, Vince, I can understand being the executive, executive producer, but Kevin Dunn. You know, Hollywood should have come calling a long time ago for a man of his talents. For the Alvin and the Chipmunks movie. But the the main thrust of Vince retiring and everybody losing their shit about it, for positive or negative, whether you liked him or you hated him, whether the some of the wrestlers are happy or sad that he's gone, and we'll talk about one of them at least, who wasn't too pleased. But how much major shit is going gonna, is gonna to change, is going to be able to change? Is there going to be conflict within the extended McMahon family if Vince doesn't want some shit changed and he sees it start to change? And 
you know, that's the only way I can think that there would be a massive departure from Vince's overall vision. There may be, you know, Triple H, is he going to go back and try to sign all the guys that are still available of his that they just fired, what, six months or a year ago? And then you get into, you know, whiplash booking, like when WCW had five different booking administrations in one year and a guy was beating everybody and three weeks later he's doing jobs for the plumber. So, I mean, you know, we we might see, hopefully, a return to more of Triple H's NXT vision of actually having some goddamn matches you'd give a shit about and making them look a little bit more important on the overall program. But, I mean, I don't know how how much of a 90-degree right turn this Titanic ship is going to take, especially when nothing happened to Vince. Vince is still existing in the world, and Vince is still, obviously, at this point, on good terms with people in his family. You talked about if all the board members walked out, how many... Stephanie's on the board, right? I believe so. Is it what Vince was on the board, and he got suspended from that when all this came out, right? I believe so. How many other board members are there, and who is it? I don't is, have it uh, in front of me. Give me a second. I was about to say, research this, because I wonder how many board members would have walked out under any circumstances. I know there's okay, a few civilians involved. Go ahead. The, here's the board of directors. Vince McMahon is on the executive board. Nick Khan is on the executive board. Stephanie McMahon is on the executive board. Paul Levesque <laughs> is, on the step, is on the executive board. One would think with the first four names, he'd probably be safe. Then on the compensation board, uh, and this is a committee member, Steve Coonan, chief executive officer of the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena. How, how, how is he in, how did he get to this position, this vaunted position? Well, he's an executive. That's what you do with board of directors. You find other executives well, you get well, along with and you well, stack we, your board with them. That's what you do. They just <laughs> say, oh, let's, let's get that guy that fucking runs the Atlanta Hawks. We hey. need him. I don't know. How did this, how was he chosen to be on the board of directors of a wrestling promotion? Well, also on the board of directors is Ignance Lehud. <laughs> The chief executive Wait, officer. You almost made me spit sprite. Ignatz. Ignatz the mouse? Ignace, excuse me. I G N A C E. Ignace. Okay. Lahoud. Chief executive officer of Mahid Al Futaim Leisure Entertainment and Cinema. What? I'm guessing this may be one of their friends from the Middle East. From the East. Well, the he's a. Uh, and soothsayer. He's and a. Committee member. Also, boy, that's just so they can say, "Hey, Igmo." All right, we don't know about those two. They may have, they may have walked over Vince. Go ahead, keep going. Also on the board of directors is Erica Nardini, the chief executive officer of Barstool Sports. She's a committee member. Committee member. Also on the board, Steve Pamone, the president of Versus. He is a committee member as well as a committee chair for governance and nominating. What do these people fucking do? That's a good question. Maybe you could ask Manjeet Singh, the former president of home entertainment for Sony Pictures Entertainment. He is on, excuse me, he's the committee chair for compensation. Let's talk about paralegals, Manjeet. Wait a minute, who's getting compensated here? And how they have a whole committee? Whose compensation do they talk about? You know what, I'll break down the committees in a second. The two other members here listed. Jeffrey R. Speed, the former executive vice president and CFO of Six Flags, Inc. And also, Alan M. Wexler, senior vice president of innovations and growth at General Motors. And somehow these people just... They call them and say, hey, come on and be on the board of this completely unrelated company that you have nothing to do with and no experience in. Well, there's no one from wrestling they would put in there. But also think about it if you ran Jim Cornette, Inc., and you had a board of directors. And let's say you have friends that run other successful companies. Like, hey, I'm going to put these guys on my board. It looks good. 
Hopefully why they go my way with the voting. Why do, the, why do I want people running successful companies on my board? They may try to take my company over. I want dumb shits, right? That way I'm smarter than they are. Yeah. Isn't that the way you do it? There are also four committees, the Audit Committee, the Compensation Committee, the Executive Committee, and the Governance and Nominating Committee. And various people have various They have a committee on nominating people to what? To the other committees? (laughs) How does it... What, do they just spend all their time just sitting around fucking committeeing with each other? They ought to be committed. So... (laughs) So now we're, 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 let's, let's identify the players again. Now Vince is retired. He's, he's going to, to his, to the home over there in Greenwich. Wait a minute. He sold that. He's got the condo in Stanford. Stephanie is the coach char woman along with Nick Khan. Triple H is head of talent relations. John Laurinaitis has been asked to leave and never return like a cast off from the odd couple. And he's walking around downtown New York carrying a suitcase on the side of the road right now. Bruce and Kevin Dunn, we mentioned, they're still around. But they were heavily, heavily tied to Vince's anal orifice. So now they've got to seek another cavern to crawl up in. What's going to happen with the creative? Do you think, since you've called this thing from the start, Brian... Do you think that we will finally see more talented in-ring guys and less gimmicks? Do you think that NXT will be rehabbed and rehabilitated from what they've done to it? Do you think it'll make any difference? Because that's what I said earlier about the whiplash booking. When it goes back and forth, even if they went back to what made NXT a better program, is it too late? Have they run people off? Will people trust it? If they come back again, will the, you know, will the fans of what the WWE is doing now, whatever it is that may be, those boring paint dry and cheese molding programs, will they stick around if Triple H brings a better in-ring product and more emphasis on the guys instead of the hoopla to the main roster, which hasn't really seen that, just NXT did. I know there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of wrestlers probably thinking, oh my gosh, this is our chance. But again, I don't know because now they're stuck in a position much like AEW has fans, but the people who are most, I would say, opposed to liking anything about AEW, mainly our audience, are people who used to like fucking wrestling and are pretty much disgusted by what it's turned into and all the foolery. The same thing works if if the fans they have left with the WWE are liking the shit they've been doing, then are they going to like that changed? And is it too late to get the people back that might like good wrestling? Your thoughts? I think creative will be interesting. It'll be the first signs to the public that there are changes when all of a sudden the word belt is used freely, when the word fans are used freely, when people can speak naturally. Let's see how this affects the commentators. How different is Michael Cole going to be without Vince yelling at him? Do you think we'll actually hear the word hospital instead of medical facility? I mean, there's going to be little changes like that, and then it's going to be bigger changes just in the overall direction. Will we get any more vomiting angles? (laughs) That's a Vince thing. And then in terms of the actual creative, that's going to be interesting. Paul Levesque was that morning, and we could talk about this in a little while, Paul Levesque was that morning brought back as the head of talent relations. Creative, I guess, is still technically under Bruce, even though Vince isn't there. Bruce's talent is pleasing the person he's trying to, like, you know, with Vince, he knows how to make Vince happy with what the show should be. I don't know if Bruce could do that for a, a Triple H or Stephanie Vision. I say Stephanie just because they're married together, but in terms of the actual show too, who's going to be Vince? Is Triple H going to be running the show? And then who's running everything else? I mean, taking Vince out of the actual event, the taping, changes the dynamic as well. Well, 
Bruce's uh, talent, as you said, is, and the reason why the Vince brought him back is imparting Vince's vision to the rest of the writing staff, whatever the case. I got to be honest with you, from everything that I've been able to determine, Bruce thinks good wrestling is kind of the WWF fucking style that Vince has mostly always had. And he forgives the Red Roosters and the fucking gobbledygookers and, you know, all of the foolery because he th it's, you know, it, it, well, I've mentioned everybody needs personality. When you get, he'd get a great talent, you'd want to mold something. Everybody needs personality and they'd fucking put him in a goddamn tutu or whatever. You know, it, so I think that's kind of the stuff he'd be doing on his own. And the question is, will Triple H and or Stephanie want that because that's what's got them to this point is the entertainment horseshit that Vince always valued up and down the, the show, whether the guys are over or not, is yeah, I sent them out there in a goofy gimmick. And I, I just, I'm not sure, but to, yeah, and, and here's another thing. If the, if the show gets more adult and I'm not talking about, everybody getting Tourette's syndrome and showing boobies. I'm talking about the guys actually being allowed to act like adults and talk like adults and fight like adults and have adult conversations instead of the stupid, you know, childish banter back and forth. Again, is it too late for the people who have already said that fucking wrestling is too silly and phony anymore? And will it... Will it offend the people who want to look at programming at a nine-year-old level? And again, I think if Bruce is there, Vince still has someone doing his bidding for him. And I think if Vince is there, there's no way Vince isn't on the phone with him, telling him what he wants things to be. If the only number that Vince's phone would dial would be the fucking time and weather, he would be on the phone with the time and weather 20 hours a day. He's got to be on the phone talking to people and trying to get shit done. Yeah, Wayne Dooley discovers Twitter, for real. <laughs> I wonder if he's ever actually seen and done it himself, or whether he has one of... When I was down there for the Hall of Fame, he had two assistants. Either that or his assistant had an assistant. Because they were both standing outside the door to his office with, like, three suits in each hand uh, so he could pick what he was going to wear on TV that night. He used to just bring his own, and it was there was one of them. So I'm sure he's probably got somebody punching the buttons on Twitter, too. We'll see what happens. I mean, that's the thing. What's he going to really do now? All his life has been WWE. Not wrestling, WWE. His wrestling. WWF, WWE. And now, apparently, that's gone. Again, we'll see. The proof will be in the pudding. We'll see what they do with Lacey Evans. We'll see what they do with various <laughs> people that appear to be Vince kind of projects. Did you see the statement that Vince McMahon issued the talent? Well, I, I did, but why don't you read it? Because it's so heartwarming, or heartwarming, whichever the case may be, and that had to be dictated by somebody else also. This was a statement, and I'm getting this from PWInsiderElite.com. Mike Johnson reporting last night at 7.32 p.m. as we are recording. The following message was issued to WWE contracted talents this afternoon via text. To all WWE superstars, as I approach 77 years old, OMG, am I really that old? <clears throat> I feel it's time for me to retire. I've thoroughly enjoyed sharing my passion, wisdom, and love of the business with you. No longer will you see the smiling, docile, level-headed, calm presence at Gorilla every week. Your dedication to WWE will ensure that our company will continue to grow and prosper. Our organization is nothing without you. You are WWE's only natural resource, chosen to perform in front of a global audience. You are all WWE global ambassadors. Carry the WWE flag wherever you go. Wave it high and proud and bust your ass to be all you can be as a person and as a performer. One other thing, I won't be with you, but I'll be watching.
<laughs> Remember to keep your hands up, grab a hold, and sell. By the way, SmackDown airs live tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central <laughs> on Fox. Vince. <laughs> he plugged okay. SmackDown to the talent? What the fuck is that? Well, and again, I know somebody wrote that for him because Vince McMahon would not say OMG. Okay, but it obviously was with Vince's approval. I'm sure they discussed it and Vince said, write something up. And I'm sure he enjoyed the self-deprecating line about his calm presence. And and he signed off. And, and then they wrote what they thought that he would get a kick out of them saying for him. And he did. And he signed off on it. That's where that statement came from. The tweet was a lot more abrupt. The tweet was real abrupt. He didn't even use all of his characters. Um, and what was the, um, oh, there was, there was a line I was going to remark on in the statement you just read also when he, he was, but keep your hands up, sell, grab a hold. That's classic Vince-isms. Uh, so they put that in there. But the, the tweet announcing his retirement was just at 77, it's time for me to retire. No. No, it's. No. Oh, 77, time for me to retire. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, old, he's two weeks older than he was two weeks ago when he was out on TV. He said, I'll be with you forever, together. Together, wherever we go. You All know right, what, the, one of these stars. What? Go ahead, what were you going to say? What I was going to say is, Anything that's being investigated right now, outside of whatever internal investigations there are, and I'm assuming this doesn't stop the internal investigations, I really don't know, but the Wall Street Journal, HBO Real Sports, any other reporters that are looking into this, if you have something or you're working on something, you're going to reach out to Jerry McDivitt, you're going to reach out to WWE for statement, for comment, before you run with it, right? Right. So they're aware of whatever's coming. So whatever caused this to be the week, for Vince McMahon to do this, that Friday afternoon, this was planned. I'm going to guess they knew a few days in advance they were going to do this. Well, or is anything coming because was it an or else situation? Unless you re retire, uh, we will do this or say this or write this. So we don't know. If, if something comes out, we'll know something came out. If something doesn't come out, we'll never know whether there was something that stayed in or not. Because after all, it's, you know, whether it's in and out. Well, in and out's how Vince got in this whole situation. Well, let me ask you about one of these things, though. We'll talk about this all right now. Stephanie McMahon opening SmackDown, leading the audience in a thank you Vince chant. Oh, if anything boy. does come out, how much worse is that going to look? Well, but it, it couldn't have been any colder if she was Mr. Freeze, right? Was that a daughter saying announcing the retirement of her beloved father who had led the company for 40 years or was that hey we're gonna get this over with and get on with the show and hope you won't notice three minutes it was three minutes vince mcmahon whether you like it or not vince mcmahon is the biggest name bar none the biggest personality the most dominant force in wrestling over the last 40 years and on his own show he got three minutes from his daughter and she's already in the ring and just abruptly breaks the news there wasn't any buildup of you know my father who took this company over from my grandfather 40 years ago and built it into no buildup of him no you know it wasn't a testimonial at a retirement dinner it was a goddamn you know impersonal pr statement to get it out and get it over with and when she announced that vince was retiring there were absolutely no cheers from the crowd and there was somewhat light and disgruntled booing and then as soon as she tried to go into her prepared remarks and mentioned the word thank you because she was going to give thanks from all of the crew and everybody to the fans, they started chanting, thank you, Vince. And she shut him up. No, you're getting ahead of me. 
Can you, was there ever any organic chant in wrestling that came up, thank you, or, or whatever, that Vince McMahon would have ever said, jump in and cut it off? Well, it's a whole new era. If there was ever a sign that there was a new era of WWE, <laughs> there it is. Um, But if this was so rushed, and you could tell by the way it was rushed and impersonal from his own daughter that it was forced, that if not, she would have baby-faced him. You know, she would have given a reason, a, even if it was a specious reason, she would have given a reason, a logical reason for him to have, be retiring. He's almost 80, and he's accomplished so much. And finally, he's decided that it's, it's the time to enjoy his family and the fruits of his labors, and the company will be in capable hands, but of course, my father is irreplaceable. And then they could have done, thank you, Vince, thank you. It, it, it was just so abrupt and uncomfortable to hear his daughter, like, getting it out of there and getting it over with. And do you think they needed to do something on the show? I mean, the story had just broken less than four hours before this. If the show had just started and moved on, it's not like the fans would have just organically started chanting, we want Vince or anything. Well, Did you have I to address this on TV? I I think yes the the stepping down of again the biggest name in the modern era of professional wrestling he's been known probably more than maybe the rock now and maybe stone cold I don't even know but it might be neck and neck with Hulk Hogan that people know who Vince McMahon is he has name recognition that transcends the wrestling business and it's his company and he's led it for 40 years and they always want a rating. I would have fucking said, Hey, at the top of the program, the huge news has been revealed today. Vince McMahon at the age of 77 is retiring after, well, it's he, he bought the company 40 years ago from his father and he was announced an announcer since what? 70. <clears throat> oh God. Early seventies. 50 years in wrestling. I would have said Monday night, we're going to have an amazing on Raw career retrospective on Vince McMahon and give the studio all weekend to put together one of the things that they do better than anybody in the fucking world of the tribute video. And they'd get a number on Monday and they would play it and make a big deal out of it and he wouldn't even need to be there in person. But more needed to be said and done. I don't care if people accused him of, you know, sodomizing a fucking Dalmatian on Broadway. The fans are going to be pissed about this because they don't get a good buy or a big fucking deal out of it. The fans that they've got left... And remember, they've still got two or three times more than AEW does. So I, I, for, for them, and just for Vince's importance, I don't know why they wouldn't, you know, make a bigger deal. At, and everybody, oh, he, was, he was doing this and that. The, their fans and their viewers don't give a shit. He's not accused of committing a crime. He's accused of paying a lot of people a lot of money not to tell, talk about what he did with them in a, a intimate situation. And with, none with that, potentially more to come out. We don't know what's well, going to come out. If it's really bad, she can't, they can't do more than this. Because she's on the board saying, of directors. None of their audience gives a shit. Now, if something bad comes out, then I will retract that statement. But I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm seeing a lot of, uh, what do they call it? The modus operandi is he's not, you know, fucking uh, tackling people in, cater in catering or down in the uh, snack bar at Titan Tower. It's an arranged situation that somehow goes sideways or with the talent, I would be more amenable to go, oh boy, if they hadn't taken money too. If somebody pisses me off and I'm indignant about it or I feel like I've been wronged or whatever the case, then I, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to not mention it or I'm going to try to get even. 
But once I take a couple million dollars for it, I'm thinking that the fucking feelings have been soothed over. Nah, you can't think like that. Because that's, look at what happened to Trump. These women, a lot of them had no idea there were other women who had similar experiences. They hear about that, they come out and they talk about it. And I think, I did, I and we don't know the details. Me, he, he and we give, don't know the details. You, you he don't didn't know even give Stormy on. Daniels $5 million and she was a professional. If he hadn't been so cheap. We don't know any of the details about what Vince did. That would have necessitated all of these payments ah. and potentially more. And if the board of directors is aware of this through their investigation and she's on the board of directors and you feel like you have to address it on TV, then this was the only way to do it. If you feel like Vince did nothing wrong, then you do a nice video package of Vince who just abruptly announced his retirement on Twitter. But they did it a certain way. I think that there's more to come out. I think that the influence of Vince on anything further will be apparent if it's there or not on TV. And that'll be the story because... I, th I think when he made his goodbye, he made his goodbye. And then he decided he didn't want to leave office. And they couldn't <laughs> figure out how to get him out. And now they realize whoever it was that talked to him, Jerry McDivitt, his family. You know, again, they announced Triple H was coming back full time that morning. We thought that was going to be the story we'd be talking about today while recording the show. Yeah, and I'm still pissed because I was waiting to see the mixed tag team match at SummerSlam. Stephanie and Triple H against Vince and Bruce. <laughs> and now we're not going to get to see that. And I was trying to figure out how, how they could come up with a finish where Stephanie beat Bruce without hurting herself. Hey, if Luger could hip toss Yokozuna, <laughs> she could take Bruce. She could take care of Bruce for a good finish. That, that used to be an old line in the locker room back when veterans knew what was going on. I mean, they'd, they'd be booked with a fucking kid that they were trying to give a push to and wherever, and the kid was going to go over, and the veteran would sit down and look at him and say, Kid, I just don't know if I can figure out a way to put you over without hurting myself. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I, you may, you may, that may be the only explanation for blowing off. It's like Mick Jagger decides to leave the Stones, and they just, okay, well, thank you, Mick. We'll see you later, and no s ceremonial tribute. It would be like if Mick Jagger left the Stones like that. If two weeks before he came out and told everyone how much he loves them, that he'll be there forever, then he made another appearance, and then all of a sudden he announces, you know what? Now is the time to retire. I was wrong. Well, now's we'll the time to know. go. Yeah, all of a sudden. We'll never know. No, we may know. But somebody else said there it was time to go, and now everybody's up in arms about uh, whether Brock actually left or not. And apparently, the story was that when Brock was given a heads up, that Vince was retiring and about to announce that on Twitter or whatever. He was like, what the fuck? And uttered some, I believe I saw it on the internet, quoted as some derivative of, if he goes, I go, and stormed out of the building. And uh, I'm sure Heyman was involved on the phone or whatever, but they got him before he got on his plane and flew back to Saskatoon, or Sask Saskatchewan, and they got him to come back, so instead of being on the first segment of SmackDown, he was on the last segment, where he came out and <laughs> beat up the young guy they're trying to push. He figured out a way to beat Theory without hurting himself. Um, Will Theory be Austin Theory again? That's a Vinceism. I hope everybody gets their names back. I really do. At least, you know, not even their real names, just two names would be good. As long as it's not Grayson Waller or Idris Enough. But so Brock bails, and you know he's a he's a he's a temperamental cat anyway, as Seth Franklin Rollins would say. Scat, but, scat, scat man, man Rollins, Rollins. Right. yeah, scat a bebop. <laughs> um, you cool cats and kittens, <laughs> but and little pussies, a lot of them around. But it, uh, some people on Twitter I saw said, "Well, is Brock?" this close or such, you know, personal friends with Vince. Well, yeah, they've been working with each other for 20 years and Vince has paid Brock by this point, tens of millions of dollars. So yeah, they're probably friendly. 
I don't know if it's a goddamn I'd take a bullet for you situation, but I think Brock probably an offshoot of one of two things. Either he's like, what the fuck? Without Vince, this place is going to go to shit. <laughs> or number two, he was probably offended at the concept of, because uh, let's face it, everybody knows Vince didn't retire on purpose. We've, you know, pretty much established he was never going to quit until he drew his last breath. But I can see Brock being upset that he's, well, they're going to make him fucking resign. Fuck that. I'm out of here. I can see that. I could also see Brock and Heyman figuring out this is a great way over the course of two hours, once word got out, to get more money for the future. Right now is the yeah. time. Well, and that's, I, we don't know what was the conversation that made Brock, enticed Brock to return to the fold in less than five hours. But uh, he he stormed out before 5 p.m. Eastern, and he was back by 9.45 to come out and beat everybody up. And you know, if Heyman got on the phone with him to try to talk him into coming back, I would have to think that financial remuneration and consideration would have to be part of that conversation. Hey, let me ask you this. If he really said those words, and we have no reason to doubt it, if he goes, I go, and then he left, and Triple H is running the show that night, what are the chances that Triple H or Stephanie get on the phone to Vince? Say, hey, Vince, call Brock and tell him it's okay to come here. I tell him that you're yep. okay with it. Do you think that happened? Or do you that, think that could happen? Oh, if it was necessary, it absolutely did happen. If, um, and, you know, the, by the uh, reporting of the incident, they may have just tried to do that first, depending on what Brock's bitch was. If it wasn't, if it was... About Vince himself, yeah, they probably went to that first. If it was about, you know, just the principle of the thing, well, why are they doing that? Well, then they may have gone to, you know, somebody close to Brock, like Heyman, that ta he takes their advice or whatever. But it may very well have been either way that Vince, you know, <laughs> I just said Vince loves to be on the phone here a little while ago. So, you know, he was standing by. It was some form of communication to that building and knew exactly what was happening pretty much as soon as it happened. So whatever the method was that they thought was best for Brock in Brock's state of mind at that point in time is what they implemented, I would think, first. But at least they don't have to call Goldberg for SummerSlam because they were reporting it. The phone calls were already going out. And, and where did it just come out within a few days of that, that Goldberg was still under contract? They could still call him at any time. Yeah, and pretty much almost needed to there, because wh that's the thing. What happens if Brock gets run over by a rainbow bread truck? Well, then they've got... Rainbow you know, Brock, it, that's the headline. <laughs> but then they've got Roman Reigns... Goldberg once a year for diminishing returns at this point and seen as making movies, made you most in pictures and sitcoms. You know what, though? If Triple H really does have a hand in creative, this is going to be one of the things that we see the difference. Because for all the complaints we want to make about Adam Cole or Keith Lee or various other people when they got brought up to the main roster in WWE, or even how they were using NXT at the end, like Theory. Triple H did get those guys over to that audience. Now, again, that's an argument. That's an AEW argument. They're over to that audience. But NXT under Triple H did a better job of taking people. Asuka, who got over great in NXT, and now I understand why you think what you think of her in the main roster, because she got under Vince's control. Yeah. So I think it does give us a little bit of hope. And again, if that doesn't happen over the next couple months, that's a clear sign that there's a bigger problem than we thought. But if all of a sudden we start seeing some of these logical changes that remind us of NXT of the past, it'll tell us what's going on. Well, you know, you just mentioned something. Over to that audience. And that's an unfortunate thing sometimes because it stunts growth, especially with AEW. There's no way that anybody else will want to break into that little private club they got going on if they don't open up their doors to people who, you know, just won't tolerate just anything. But with 
With Triple H, he got guys over to the NXT audience with the main roster, Raw and SmackDown. They have an audience, but nobody's over to it. That audience, I think, it's the habit. We watch SmackDown. It's what we do. It's what we've done. Sure, it's boring now. Sure, and Raw, same thing. Sure, it's boring now, but I've likened wrestling sometimes in the past to the you know, horrible, abusive relationship that you don't want to bring to an end because you think that it will be better, but they haven't gotten any better. So they've got an audience, but nobody is over to that audience. And Triple H, since he did it once with an affiliated audience of SmackDown and Raw, NXT, maybe he can do it again that since those people are still sitting there, at least he can get some of the guys over to them. Because right now it's just, it's the product, it's the brand, it's the idea of going to see the WWE as the casual fan that, oh, we'll go to a SmackDown. But there's nothing interesting to really get people fired up and invested in that guy or that match or that feud, except when they bring in the stars from the past because those guys are over. So maybe. Triple H can at least help tighten up that loophole that they've come up with where they've got an audience, but they don't care about any one particular individual enough. We'll see. I mean, NXT pushed a guy named Tommaso Ciampa and he got up to oh, WWE boy. and all of a sudden he's just a guy and he has half of his name. We're not Gargano fans, but he pushed a guy named Johnny Wrestling <laughs> on TV. <laughs> so, I mean, there's going to be clear signs if there is a change and it's a Triple H style change but again bruce is still there what's bruce gonna do if vince has no hand in creative and creative goes in a different direction yet bruce is still the liaison between the office and whoever's supposed to do what they have to do he's gonna be able to just relay a whole different system of wrestling a whole different way of looking at it it's gonna be interesting well you know i think ultimately all of these people need a good night's sleep. You, you got to, you want Vince, now he's finally retired. He hadn't stopped working in the past 50 years. He's going to need a good night's sleep because that's especially important for the elderly, especially the elderly that don't have any hobbies and aren't going to really be able to relax no matter what they do. Or Triple H, now he's got much more uh, responsibility on his plate. And he's had heart issues. He's going to have to make sure he takes care of himself, gets plenty of sleep. Stephanie, she's got to dream up all kinds of different ways to cut Nick Khan's balls off and take total control. So she's going to need a good night's sleep so she can dream up those things. You know where I'm going with this, Brian. It all comes down to one thing. A good night's sleep makes you more productive, whether you're a plumber or a doctor or a lawyer or in high, high corporate intrigue at the highest levels of executiveness. That's what the people at Helix Sleep can do for you. Folks, all you got to do is take a two-minute sleep quiz. If you've just been, if you're, for example, a recently deposed uh, chairperson of a major billion-dollar company, well, now you got two minutes because you don't have a job. So you go to helixsleep.com, you take the two-minute sleep quiz. They match you to a customized mattress that gives you the best sleep of your life. We've talked about them. They got soft ones. They got hard ones. You know, a lot of people, could, that would fit. But they've even got medium ones. The mediums are the best. Not too soft, not too hard. Whether you sleep on your side, your back, your stomach, standing on your head, moving around all night, sitting cross-legged, whatever you position you put yourself in on this mattress. It's going to be fantastic. That's why they were awarded the best number one overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ magazine. And those golfers, after a hard day on the links, they love a good night's sleep. It's so, not golfers. We went over this already. Golf quarterly, I thought no, you said. No, gentlemen's quarterly. 
What do you mean a golfer can't be a gentleman? Well, some golfers are. Do you think are. all golfers are just rude pricks out there? Why do you think they yell four before they hit you in the head with a with a ball? I think golfers who cheat are not gentlemen, but golfing's obviously a game of gentlemen. Well, the rules of golf are kind of negotiable, aren't they? You're out there in the field. There's nobody really watching you close. You got a long space between you and your opponent. You could fudge a little and nobody would know. So you're a cheater. No, have I'm you played a golf? Have you played golf? Never in my life. Do you have any interest in playing golf? Never in my life. Why? What the fuck am I going to do? First of all, if I want to go out in the middle of the field, I want some trees. I want some deer. I want. I, I could take my dog to play. You could hit the golf ball of deer and trees. No, no, Just take the I don't golf ball of tea. It's a bunch of, like George Carlin said, a bunch of rich white fucks with nothing better to do chasing a little ball around a fucking field they ought to take all those golf courses for all those rich billionaire white fucks and that's where you ought to put the homeless a lot of good ground property is being taken up by this ridiculous hobby that takes way too long and is boring as shit but if you need a good night's sleep afterwards you can get right on top of a helix sleep mattress <laughs> Did I mention you can take their two-minute sleep quiz and they will match you? I've talked about the positions that you can be in on the mattress, missionary, doggy style, reverse cowgirl. Oh, come on. Will you stop it? So when you go to helixsleep.com slash JCE and take that quiz, get matched to the mattress, they bring it to your house. Though they don't bring it, they ship it. Every once in a while, you'll see an unmarked panel van put up, pull up to your front door, and they'll pull a mattress out. But if I were you, I wouldn't answer the door when they knock. Helix will be labeled. You'll see the, the fine Helix label there. You'll know to open the door for those folks. Well, remember... The, what now? I mean, there's no reason why you can't just have people leave it on your doorstep and you bring it in yourself. That's one of the great things about Helix mattress. It's not hard to move around, and then, of course, it all uncurls once you open it that's one yes. of the miracles of helix it doesn't uncurl it expands expands and, and self-inflates but i don't know about leaving it on your porch it depends what neighborhood you live in up there you got a problem with bears you know bears love these mattresses as a matter of fact every helix sleep mattress comes with a can of bear mace just in case that the oh. bears wander too close try to get a hold of the helix sleep mattress they're popular with all forms of wildlife it doesn't come with bear mace, for the record. Not all of them. They've got a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free, and they will even pick it up for you if you don't love it. Of course, we've talked about the people that come and pick it up and the way that they'll treat you afterwards stop, because stop you're a no-good prick Can that you took stop? it under false pretenses, and now you want your money back. They will happily say, oh, you didn't like it. We'll give you your money back and pick it up without any... Physical violence or... They sure will. They, they will do that. And then a couple days afterwards, when the heat dies down, you just be looking over your shoulder. But right now, folks, Helix is offering oh. up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. All you got to do, I mentioned it, go to Helix. That's H-E-L-I-X, helixsleep.com slash J-C-E. And you're going to get up to $200 off and two free pillows, depending on what you purchase and whether you pay for it or not. They don't like you if you purchase something and don't pay for it. That's not cricket. Helixsleep.com slash JCE. Well, Jim, before we completely move on as much as we can from the Vince topic here this week, I wanted to ask you about a couple of tweets I saw. Did you see uh, any of the Twitter activity after the news broke about Vince McMahon? Oh, boy, howdy. Uh, people were jumping on depending on what their side was, either for him or against him. But uh, what did you specifically see? Well, I have two here, different sides of the spectrum, or at least different ways of addressing this. Gerald Briscoe on Twitter, again, longtime WWE employee, sold his share of Georgia to Vince McMahon and had a job for many, many years. Disappointed to see all you jabronis celebrating the retirement of the man who created a world that gave you so much enjoyment growing up. If Vince never existed, all you Marks would have sadder lives than you already do. <laughs> That's Jerry for you. No, it, Gerald Briscoe likes Vince McMahon. They've worked together for 40 years. He's been very, Vince was very good to Jerry and vice versa. And 
a lot of the, I guess, you can take an opinion from somebody in the business, I guess, especially somebody that's had personal uh, interaction with Vince, either positive or negative. But to see a lot of the fans go, ah, yeah, it's time he's gone, blah, blah, blah. For somebody that's a friend of his, it's worked with him closely. I can see where Jerry would be a bit ticked off. Well, Jerry had a second tweet, a little more than an hour, actually one hour and one minute later. I guess he heard some blowback. To be clear, the <laughs> allegations of workplace misconduct are very serious and disappointing to me. I applaud the board for holding people accountable for their actions. <laughs> Who got to him? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, what, this is, what does Jerry care if people knock him on Twitter? So I don't know, but maybe that was a prepared statement from the WWE office. I'm not sure. Maybe he has stock. I don't know. But I did see um, the other CEO, the other guy. It, it, that's like the other white meat. Tony Khan is the pork of pro wrestling. Vince was the chicken. Tony is the pork. And he, do you have his tweet? Can you read it? I don't know if I can do justice to it without it using his exact words. I have it here right now. Tony Khan last night tweeted, Thanks to you wrestling fans and your great support of AEW, I'm grateful to now be the longest tenured CEO in pro wrestling. <laughs> Thank you very much to every single person who watches AEW on TV. See you Friday night for AEW Rampage on TNT Drama, 10 p.m., 9 p.m. Central, tonight! <sighs> so Vince plugs his show to the talent, and Tony plugs his show to the <laughs> general public. Interesting. Well, yeah, but in the meantime, Vince gives a tongue-in-cheek statement that was obviously written by one of his assistants, and Tony <laughs> writes his own and comes off like a 12-year-old kid, bragging that he won... A one-horse race. There are no other CEOs in pro wrestling. Well, I, I don't know how some of these independent organizations are structured or set up, or if they even are set up, if there is paperwork with their various state uh, governments. But is there another I'm the CEO, CEO of Arcadian Vanguard. I'm longer tenured than Tony Khan. Well, Yeah. You know, and, and also, but I mean, a, of a wrestling promotion. Is there I another CEO? Oh, well, New Japan. Do they have a CEO or just a president? I think he's the president. And Scott Demore is not the CEO of anything. And, and there's the men's hair club. But <laughs> again, Tony. Cy Sperling? Yeah. Old Cy, he's been around for a while. And he's, and he's a customer, too. But <laughs> Tony can't help but being a adolescent kid about this shit of, of all the things he could have said that just comes off so stupid and childish yes he's been the ceo of his own company he started with his daddy's money three years ago the same thing vince did well but at least he at bought least, the company with his daddy's money because he took the company profits to pay for it. Well, but at least he actually used some of the money that would technically go to him as the owner to pay for it rather than just... Yeah, but the point is, I'm sorry, Tony, but when you can brag about being a CEO for 40 years or whatever, then that's, that's something to brag about. But just because the other guy quit running and there's nobody else in the race doesn't really make you goddamn a fucking superstar who was that guy that ran the four minute mile roger bannister i don't think tony's in that company yet i think it's delusional and maybe if he worried about trying to act more professionally instead of acting like one of his most ardent fans in the seats he would have a, a little bit better public image than fucking rick moranis on goddamn meth is your problem for the person that's going to argue tony khan was just making a joke is your problem the joke or the fact that the ceo of aew is making the joke the ceo of aew is making the joke it's ridiculous can you see if the situation was reversed vince would even acknowledge the incident he would dance on the grave <laughs> of the incident, Pri actually. Privately, <laughs> but he wouldn't tweet about, ha, ha, ha. 
Tony, Tony got sent to his room or whatever. No, it's just so stupid. It's the, the owner of the company acting like the fans and that's just stupid, but it looks like as we'll talk about later on in the program, you know, his, uh, his show looks like a fan fucking produced it. So there you go. But, but uh, again, no, uh, positive or negative, whatever you think of Vince, Tony Khan needs to start acting like the boss of a national televised wrestling promotion instead of a fan booking from his basement. But that would require him to change his entire life. Here's a question for you, and I don't know the answer. Vince McMahon owns, I don't know the exact percentage of stock, but 80% of the voting shares. But he owns that. And he's retired from WWE. But Vince McMahon himself, not WWE, owns those shares. You think Vince would ever get to the point where he would try to buy the company back? No, I don't. Because, honestly, I mean, it's not like if somebody outside... Get some investors to put up the money. Get J.P. Morgan to put up a few billion dollars and try to get the company. But hold on, if somebody from outside had taken over somehow and not only ousted Vince, but Stephanie and Triple H, then yeah, I bet you he would. But right now, he'd be buying the company out from under his daughter and son-in-law. He knows he's 77. Even if he's got another 15, 20 years, whatever, they're pretty close to, as you've mentioned before, selling this thing for billions of dollars. So I don't know if he would want to rock that boat now because if they sell it for billions of dollars, billions of those dollars are going to go to him and however much more to his daughter and son-in-law. So if all of them were gone, if somebody just taken it over and he didn't have any say anymore through his family and minions... Yeah, I think he'd do everything, including, you know, knocking on the door of 1241 East Main Street in Stamford with a fucking billy club trying to take it back. They're about to move into their new buildings. He's not even going to go with them. Maybe. Well, I bet they'll have a Vince Memorial office on the fourth floor in the corner just so that, you know, and maybe it'll be a display like a Vince Museum. But anyway, but that's the thing is I don't see him screwing that up for not only the kids but also himself when they still stand to make a fortune whenever and now you know now that he's not actively running it is it more attractive to him that they go ahead and sell it and and are stephanie and triple h going to necessarily argue at that point if they're going to get a a ton of money out of it i think that maybe they're thinking well we'll get this thing back in shape so the sale price will be higher let's get our talent in order let's you know get the proper people in place yeah fox is watching fox is watching but i don't think they're going to start now trying to go into something like that that would take whoever knows how long and raise a lot of questions and muddy the water you brought up before that vince has been a commentator for a long time And then, of course, in 1980, him and Linda start a company, and in 82, they buy Capital Wrestling. They pay installments. Vince and Linda, or Vince pays installments to the different owners other than his dad out of the company profits, and then he has full control. Well, let's go over that real quickly for a second. Just for some of the newer listeners, Vince agreed to buy Capital Wrestling, the old WWF, from his father, Vince Sr., for what was it, a million dollars, and he had to make quarterly payments, and if at any point he didn't make the payments or it wasn't paid off on the you know the uh, appropriate time, it would revert back to his dad. But it was a promotion and a business that was already ongoing and having a hot period, and so he just stepped in and used the money off the towns that was already coming in to make the payments and never didn't have to actually spend any of his own money if he indeed had any at that time. And it was a cheap price, all things considered. Think about how much money that company was making in 81, 82. Yeah, they, well, they were they were grossing over a million dollars a year just in the garden. So 
And he paid a million dollars to the partners for everything. Yeah. So it wasn't like it was a, you know, it was a big risk. It wasn't, you know, an iffy type of thing. The company was already running and had been running for decades. But the risk was going national. And then the big risk was putting up everything for WrestleMania. But actually getting right. the company from his dad and the other partners, Savaldi, Gorilla Monsoon, Zacco, that was Skoland, I guess I should say also. That was the most easy business deal you could ever have. I'll, I'll walk into this restaurant that's already operating and turning people away at the door and I'll just buy it with the money it's taking in. That's what he did at the uh, Cape Cod. What was it? The Cape Cod Coliseum or the whatever? Cape Cod Coliseum. Remember it was a Coliseum open and running and losing money. He just went in there and goes, okay, I'll pay for the mortgage payments. Let me run it. And they said, okay, he didn't put any money down. He just started paying monthly as he went for a place that had lost a lot of money. He did the same thing for WWE or WWF, but they hadn't lost a lot of money. They were making millions. Well, and that, what will Vince McMahon's legacy be is a, a question I've heard people saying or asking. And for good and for bad, because there's a lot of good too. I mean, it's, it's a weird thing. I know people don't want to hear that, especially now, but for all the bad changes, there were some good things that he brought to wrestling as well. Well, and it, it also depends on your point of view. And everybody knows what mine has been in the style of wrestling. And why couldn't, you know, uh, Bill Watts have won the war if, if things had worked out differently? So, you know, the product wouldn't be... Can you imagine those yeah. articles in the Wall Street Journal right now? <laughs> <laughs> Watts would go to the Wall Street Journal offices and fucking take a dump in the goddamn boardroom. Or piss out the window, he, you know, but the thing is, for better or worse, depending on what your viewpoint is, Vince has been the man in wrestling for 40 years. Now, he did what none of the other promoters would do, and as a result of that, became the only guy doing that thing, and it stood out, and he was based in New York, and he knew how to market. But what he did killed the rest of the wrestling business forevermore. And it wasn't because I've heard a lot of people say, well, once they'd seen the first class production and the, you know, all the bells and whistles, no. <sighs> once you open the door and establish to everybody openly that wrestling was just entertainment, was fixed, fake, choreographed, worked, however you want to phrase it, then you've already started limiting the audience. And then it becomes, okay, who can do the, the fake show the best? And that was Vince because he was the only one that would make the move to do an obviously openly fake show. The other promoters made fortunes in their own areas, but they didn't want wrestling to be that big, to be publicly traded, to be on the, you know, the six o'clock news every night and on the cover of every magazine because that would have exposed the business, brought attention, scrutiny. Everybody would have known, especially in the modern era with social media, what the fuck was going on. They weren't going to do that because they wanted to keep their ability to make their money and their territory for the next 20 fucking years. And a lot of people have said, including some learned observers, it never made any difference when they told people that wrestling was a work. How the fuck do you figure that? There's now no, there's only two wrestling promotions. And until three years ago, there's only one of any size. It made a lot of difference. You limited your audience to the people who want to watch an obvious show and that are diehard enough fans of that to want to know everything about it and spend a lot of money per head on it and devote a significant portion of their life to it. You lost everybody else that used to watch one hour of TV a week and maybe get that fucking ticket for the show once a week or once a month in town, and that was the extent of their involvement. So... When Vince did that, because that was his vision, he wanted to have showbiz wrestling. 
Always. He wanted to be the Walt Disney of wrestling in 1986. Then nobody else could do it because everybody else's wrestling was predicated on and depended on you losing yourself in the moment and the heat on the heels and the baby faces triumph and come back and blah, blah, blah. And that wasn't there anymore because everybody saw through it and they, and they knew what the fuck was going on. It's just like when Vince was brilliant in establishing the network and moving everything, including the pay-per-views over to the network, it cost them a fortune until they ended up making hundreds of millions of dollars from Peacock. But what it did also was put every other wrestling promotion out of the fucking pay-per-view business, except for the ones that are going to get a hundred or 200,000 buys for AEW or TNA never even did that much because why pay $50 for a show when you can get everything ever put on tape for $5 a month? Everything that Vince did to change the wrestling business to his vision of it was mostly successful. And there's guys he's paid millions and millions of dollars to. And people in far-flung parts of the world know about wrestling. Unfortunately, it's just the WWE version of wrestling. But Vince made a company that is now worth somewhere around $5 billion. And not all of it was honest, but find me a company that's worth $5 billion that was even as honest as Vince has been, probably. So you can't argue the success and the stars that he made and the money that he made and that he paid people and the the vision, or not the, the visibility of those people that went into movies and the visibility of the business, et cetera, has never been in question. We've always said he he ran the best business. He found the best people. He didn't do a TNA Dixie Carter and hire a bunch of fucking people fresh out of college that didn't know shit from apple butter and couldn't grab their ass with both hands. He didn't do the Jim Crockett and keep his same office staff and same number of them in a fucking converted convenience store when he was on national TV. He didn't do a lot, didn't make a lot of the mistakes that the other people made. The only thing that most wrestling aficionados, especially of the as the years have gone on, that had a problem with was the fake, phony, silly, goofy sports entertainment, which killed the wrestling business. Because, again, you couldn't do sports entertainment better than Vince because that was his vision and everybody else tried and he got there first and he knew that. But you couldn't do real wrestling anymore because the biggest promotion is telling everybody it's all fake. So he simultaneously built his own company and doomed everybody else to irrelevancy. And I think that's his legacy. To some people, he was very, very good. And to some people, he was very, very bad. He was more successful than anybody else in wrestling at what he did. But unfortunately, that led to the ruination of every other wrestling promotion because you can't, you can't have people taking something seriously when the leader is doing a parody. And there you have. I think there's more to it, though, because I think part of the problem was there was no one prepared to fight him. So here he is presenting this parody, as you put it. And I mean, go look at TNT. I mean, now people could laugh at it and appreciate the camp nature of it. But compared to everything else in wrestling before or at that time, compared to everything else on television, guys in the business wanted to fucking fight and punch walls when they were watching that because there's guys going out trying to fucking cut their heads and break their bodies and fucking get heat and sell tickets. And it's a on national cable is a clown show with some of wrestling's biggest names. It was fucking insulting. I think, you know, cause I'm one of those believers that's out there that most people are told, cause I was early on a lot of other people. I've heard Jerry Jarrett say it. We're told early on that it's fake and we just got to live with it and we got to lose ourselves in it. The problem became everyone started chasing Vince in one way or another whether it was creating networks for your shows that you couldn't support, 
or changing the style of your wrestling. I mean, Jim Hurd was just trying to be yeah. his version of Vince McMahon. The ding dongs were for the kids, like the gobbledygooker. Yeah, Big Josh was for the kids. I mean, even though he's a kick ass wrestler, he's coming out with a fucking bear. That's not for an adult to jump up and down. Everyone started chasing Vince. Everyone started chasing his production. And I think one of the big things, actually, when you talk about the cartoonish nature of various things, the way it hurt wrestling was the people who got into wrestling grew up watching that. Yeah. And then they think that's what wrestling is. And when people go, no, 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 just a few years before it, things happened that made sense and people paid to see that. It's like, no, no, but I saw, you know, and then they named some goofy thing that they got a kick out of when they were six. And that, that kind of makes my point. Because of mismanagement in, in WCW from the start, his only competition, and the dearth of the territories to make new talent, even Vince in the mid-90s went in a fucking hole, and then they hot-shotted everything, both companies, and then by the time that was over and Vince won, everybody'd run out of shit to do, and, and all the fans had seen everything. And the one person they had faith in, Steve Austin, then then they didn't because he switched heel. And then their options were gone. It was WWF or nothing. And the business never really recovered from that. And it hurt but Vince like you too. said, it hurt Vince too. Yeah, it hurt it hurt Vince a lot. But like you said, now the people that have gotten into wrestling grew up watching either WWF or the indies that were trying to take the place of, you know, what we had lost. And so then you have people getting a kick out of shit and wanting to emulate untrained goofiness because they think that's what wrestling was. So again, Vince, for the people that were on his side and on his team and shared his vision, they were more successful and he led them to more riches and notoriety than they would have ever had before ever or since in their life. And for the people who liked the wrestling business and I'm, I'm on both those sides. He paid me a ton of fucking money, but then again, I fucking loved wrestling and I hate that we don't have it anymore. And it's mostly directly because of Vince. So I qualify for both parts so I can see both sides. And, you know, we have to also say that it wasn't necessarily always a fair fight. Now, certainly Vince had a better operation. He had an operation. He had a staff. He had an office. Yeah. He had serious executives and people who may not have cared about wrestling as much as they cared about making sure the marketing and the promotion of this product is okay. He had the right people. That doesn't mean he didn't do predatory things. He tried oh, no. to screw with everyone. It was never a fair fight. It was never, all right, me against Crockett on pay-per-view. Let's see who the best man will win. No, it was, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent them from getting on pay-per-view. <laughs> I'm going to threaten people with WrestleMania. It was one thing after another. He tried to mess with every promoter, and eventually there weren't any promoters, and eventually there weren't any promotions, and eventually he couldn't find good talent. But... He was someone who definitely, because later on he pretended he was Mr. Good Guy with the Ted Turner thing, the manufactured Ted Turner feud in his head. <laughs> but look at the way he went after every territory and every promotion, and you were in Crockett Promotions. You saw what happened. Yeah. So it wasn't a fair fight. It wasn't like, and he, he probably would have won anyway, just based on everything I said. He had the operation. He had Hogan, right time, right place, the cartoon. But he still went after promotions and did everything he could to hurt them. Well, yeah, and, and just when you say he would have won, he probably would have. Once again, he had Hogan, he had New York, and he had that office infrastructure, but Crockett would have still been in business providing an alternative product if, he ha if Vince had not sabotaged Crockett's efforts to get on pay-per-view. Because at that time, the money that Crockett would have grossed on pay-per-view would have more than paid off the debts that he had when he had to sell to TBS. I mean, just a couple of pay-per-views. That would have been it. It would have been fine. And Crockett would continued on, but he overextended himself buying the television time slots and the promotions and the 
extra added expense of getting an office in Dallas and a blah, blah, blah. And all of that was in response to Vince. Bill Watts's yep. package of TV shows outside of the Mid-South area, the expansion to become the UWF was in response to Vince. And then he couldn't support that. And then they had to sell it to Crockett and he couldn't support that. Yeah. And like, but like I said, the pay-per-view, if, if Starcade 87 and Bunkhouse Stampede 88 had gotten on full pay-per-view coverage, they would have made the revenue they were in the hole when they had to sell. But then it took Turner Broadcasting getting involved where what the 88 bash was the first time we were actually on uh, pay-per-view full coverage and Vince had almost a two-year head start by that point. So, you know, that that's the thing is, uh, it, but it's not like that those tactics were unusual in professional wrestling, just there had been no pay-per-view. But I mean, it it goes back to the old days of, sending people out on the street to tear the opposition's posters down. It's the same flavor. It just changes with the times. But that's Vince's legacy. He's Satan and, and Jesus both at the same time, depending on who you were and which side of the argument you were on. And in some cases, he can be both, because you could be on both sides of the fucking fence at various points. You think he'll go into the WWE Hall of Fame? Uh, well, eh, now you've got me scared about the stories of him and the Dalmatian on Broadway coming out. Who knows what? But And then there's also Vince's thing was he never wanted to be thanked at the Hall of Fame. Every producer had to tell every speechmaker, speechifier, whether they were inducting or being inducted or indicted or whatever, don't thank Vince. He hates that. So it might be against his will, but will that be a PR move at any point that, that they don't want to take? With that said, does the opening of SmackDown make a little more sense? That Vince doesn't want to be thanked. He doesn't like that kind of attention. Well, no. <laughs> because in this case, it wasn't going to be, or it shouldn't have been, Stephanie out there going, so I'm going to lead you in a chant of thank you, Vince. They got that organically, and they would have known that that was going to come up as soon as they mentioned the buzzword of, you know, we want to thank all you fans. And they knew immediately they were going to say thank you, Vince. If she didn't, she's insane. So, no, that wasn't they're trying to get it over with uh, like that. That uh, No. Again... They were trying to get the news out and get it over with rather than sincerely, you know, caring what Vince's feelings apparently were at that point in time or else wise they would have, she would have done it in a more heartfelt fashion. But I don't think Vince said, I know I've announced I'm retiring, but don't let them chant. Thank you, Vince. He, from the fans, he's fine. He didn't want the boys constantly groveling in public. Well, very interesting. We'll see how this changes things in a number of ways, from the on-air to the behind-the-scenes to the relationship certain talent, from The Undertaker to Brock Lesnar or whoever else have with the company. We're about to embark on a very interesting period for WWE and all of wrestling. This is going to affect wrestling. Will the word wrestling be used again on WWE TV? That! I can't wait to see if that happens or not. And we'll see how long Brock is, because just because he came back, doesn't mean he might necessarily... Is there something with him and Triple H? Uh, who knows? But um, I don't know what his contract length is. It was, instead of length, it's probably number of dates. But if, if he gets cranky with them and they can't bring Brock back for the big shows, ooh, they better hope that The Rock and Nick Khan and Nick Khan's sister... What, what's her name? Uh, Anastasia... I forget what or her name was. It Nanochka. wasn't that. Okay. It, was it Nanochka? It may have been. There's a Nanochka Khan. Someone was named Nanochka Khan, but now I don't remember if it was her or someone else. I can't remember. It's some person in television. I think they're on Family Guy. But anyway, so we'll see. what. Maybe they get the rock for WrestleMania through all of his childhood friends. Otherwise, they better keep Brock happy. Hey, we'll see how talent reacts to this. How many wrestlers gave up on the idea of going to WWE and went to AEW because they didn't want to get under Vince's control. They didn't want to do that kind of stuff. They wanted to work with their friends, of course. 
Well, also, let's be honest, how many guys went to AEW because they didn't have the option? Because Vince would have looked and gone. But the guys who had the option, would they have thought differently of the move if it was Triple H on top as opposed to Vince McMahon? Even the guys who like Triple H, it was always Triple H, unless his father-in-law does something crazy, like sends him home. Well, the, uh, probably the guys from NXT might very well have stuck around. So we'll see. The, the Laurinaitis effect. He runs off everybody except the lingerie models and the illegal paralegals. <laughs>